I'm playing a mech game. I'm playing a mech game. Oh god, oh shit, fuck, I'm sorry. So, um, welcome to Domestic Terrorism Simulator. Or, as it's more commonly called in the Steam storefront, Brigador, Up Armored Edition. You play as a mech pilot with the mission to destroy assets, mechs, and kill people who serve the oppressive fascist cyberpunk government. It's a top-down shooter focused around tactics, positioning, and knowledge of your mech and weapons. It's an interesting game with some interesting ideas, mechanics, and progression. Let's start with the presentation. Brigador is obviously a top-down isometric shooter, and it looks gorgeous. It's high quality, it's sharp, and... Well... This is a game about blowing up space Nazis in space who work for a fascist space government. So yeah, I, I kind of thought it would look a lot worse, but no, it's um... I can very confidently and easily say it's one of the more detailed games I have played in years. Especially for a 2D title. It's pretty easy with 2D games to focus far more on gameplay than visuals, but Brigador doesn't suffer from that thankfully. It is so bloody detailed. It's obviously a cyberpunk game. So if you or someone you love has a serious love for cyberpunks, shanty towns, and corporate hotspots being exploded, stomped on, then well, just keep watching because it's it's very obviously cyberpunk, right? Neon signs and lights are more plentiful than water on this planet, it so seems. It is a concrete jungle, and I am one of those big grinder trucks from Avatar. Brigador's art style is like a high-resolution pixel art. That's how I would describe it anyway. Everything is densely packed, and all of it is detailed, as I said. But it's also just stylistically quite good. You get these little hints of character and the cyberpunk aesthetic is very obvious, so if you like it, then this might be the game for you. The pure volume of unique assets present in Brigador is no small amount. Everything is detailed, nothing stands out as noticeably low quality. It's just good. And then you blow something up and the destruction also looks good. The debris also has the same amount of thought put into it, frankly if not more than the standard non-destroyed buildings, because everything explodes in this game. Everything. So, the maps are beautifully realized, with assets that are singularly beautiful, but much like an orchestral piece, when combined they are more than the sum of their parts. The biggest and most impressive visual element for me are the vehicles, however. Brigador features 56 unique vehicles, and these are the one only the ones you can use. Enemies probably have more than 56. And, of course, I do wish I could drive the enemy vehicles, because the designs do look pretty cool. Within the Brigador narrative, we have three factions. The Loyalists, the remains of the Great Leader's military, effectively. And they're your typical high-tech military. They have all the normal-looking mechs and tanks. They're traditional, made for war. It's pretty standard here. They have bipedal killing machines that were made in factories for that very purpose. And then you have the Rebels, who are... For lack of a better phrase, the equivalent of Florida Man. They're a bunch of farming gear that somehow got access to weapons and decided to overthrow the government. It's basically any one of those militia groups over in the US of A. They have party vans, cars stacked up on top of each other into a supercar. It's really whatever goes here. And somehow they go toe to toe with high tech mechs and tanks. I don't ask questions. And then you have the spacers, which are space bandits. Their vehicles are more like weaponized moon rovers. They raid the cities of Solo, no bro, and they sell loot for money. It's space pirates. They're like upgraded rebels, but more industrial, I guess. But in general, the game features, as far as I can tell, and as the storm page informs me, 56 unique vehicles. And only some of them are your normal bipedal mech. We have like anti-gravity floating vehicles, behemoths, tanks, uh, stacked cars with turrets attached. It's really varied, and honestly, all of them look great. They fit into the style and the atmosphere of the world they are in, and that's massive. That's a fucking beautiful, beautifully difficult undertaking. It's very hard to create a cohesive world with 56 unique vehicles. Some of them are your typical sci-fi murder machines, and they look menacing as destructive as you can imagine, but a lot of them do just seem ragtag and put together, like they were just mashed together from industrial equipment and normal cars. And some of them are also fucking massive as well. But they all look good, and they also look beautiful when they fire, when they explode. And for a more technical analysis, I think they might be 2D sprites made from 3D models. Like they're taking different renders of a 3D model from every possible angle and using them as sprites. That's what I think, anyway. 
And thank God they're not 3D models because they would just stick out heaps and it would honestly lower the quality of the game a lot. What about the sound of Brigador though? Well, it's pretty good. Shooting in Terran for a Cyberpunk shitty has never sounded better. A persistently great soundtrack penetrates the carnage. It's also the soundtrack of this video. I don't really know what genre to attribute it to though, but whatever it is, it sounds pretty good. We have some calmer tracks, some more exciting tracks, and plenty to take place between those two. The mixing does place importance on the music, but it is also important to talk about how the sound effects are present in game sound. Well, shooting enemies sounds really good. Guns are punchy with the right amount of bass. Every unique weapon also sounds different, which is a really nice touch. Uh, let's change gear to mechanics now. The first thing you need to wrap your head around in Brigador is the controls. Because much like a tank in nearly any other game, you control the vehicle as Brigador with tank controls. The controls are quite flexible, but I highly recommend tank controls. The other scheme is kind of shit and hard to control. And for the unknown among you, basically, tank controls mean that where you aim is not where your legs are pointing, basically. You move and aim independently of each other. This is important as most vehicles are stronger on the front and weaker on the sides, and weakest on the back. This lets you maneuver much more cleverly. It also lets you shoot behind you, provided you have a weapon that can turn itself 360 degrees. The second thing that might take some getting used to is, if you, is that if you're new to this game, or oh, this game's like this, really. This might look like a 2D game, visually. But when you aim, you're aiming in a 3D space. You can aim above and below. You can shoot your feet or over a wall. This gets more interesting because some, some vehicles kind of have a way of lowering their height. They can crouch or they can turn off the hover jets on the bottom of a flowering car and then they can like, you know, scratch across the ground kind of thing. And Again, this is just another way of positioning yourself in combat, and before combat. It adds a kind of cover system into the game as well. You can use buildings as cover, and if your vehicle is tall enough, you can even just fire over the top of them. So, so far, this game is fairly mechanically complex or detailed. And in terms of mechanics, it doesn't really get much more complex. There are some interesting tidbits of information though that interact with the previously mentioned mechanics. Like, for example, the world is fully destructible. If you see a wall or a building, you can go for it. You can ambush enemies to get the tactical upper hand. You can create choke points. You can even shoot through thin material like sheet metal without destroying the material. It's a neat touch and it opens up a lot of tactical options. Most vehicles have three weapons, a primary, a secondary, and a tactical slot. Primary and secondaries are interchangeable. It's actually talking more so about mouse 1 or mouse 2, not the potential damage output of each weapon. The tactical, shot, tactical slot is occupied by either a sonic wave that hurts stuff around it, a smoke field that blocks line of sight, an active camo which allows you to reposition in the thick of combat, and finally an EMP grenade which disables enemies. And all of these work together to enable different ways of engaging in combat and destroying buildings. You could theoretically 100% stealth levels. There is an alert system in the game and you could do levels entirely in stealth. Although it is triggered by spotter enemies seeing you. So you could just kill the spotter enemies and that might count as stealth. Maybe. I don't know. But weapons also have different noise stats. So I guess you could actually do it. It won't be a splinter cell, but you'll be about as stealthy as a mech can be. So, what about the two modes of play in the game? Most players will start with the campaign, which acts as a sort of tutorial, but I would say it's not the best introduction to the game. It kind of paints the wrong picture in my opinion. It spends hours drilling the mechanics into your brain, but it does it in a, a quite a weird way. It seems to neglect the more content-rich freelancer mode, which I'll get to later. Throughout the campaign, you are presented with a series of diff different vehicles with singular loadouts. But Freelancer is about picking a vehicle from a list of like, it seems like over a hundred, and then picking weapons. It is effectively building your own loadout. So it's really weird that the campaign tries to present the game as a series of challenges, but not the sandbox that it actually is. 
And this isn't to say the campaign isn't fun, because it still is fun. But it does ultimately exist so that you can get money so you can experiment in the freelancer mode. And how do you get money? Well, the game is flexible in that regard. You get money for basically doing anything. Even killing civilians nets you, as far as I can tell, $50, which is fucking hilarious. Which to a point means that mass destruction gets you more money. But I'm pretty sure that clearing a stage quickly also nets you a bonus. I don't really know what actually nets you more cash, honestly, but the point is, you could easily do whatever the fuck you want and still be progressing and still having fun. Destroying buildings gives cash. Killing enemies gives cash. cash. Um, knocking out supply buildings gives you ammo gives you cash. It all gives you cash, which is nice. It means that you can do whatever you want as long as you're there to complete objectives so you can leave the level. The campaign, as I mentioned earlier, is just a tutorial for 12 missions and then it gets expanded to a sort of challenge mode for the game. You have set objectives and handcrafted maps where the enemies don't change and the objectives stay static. It is a handcrafted experience, and as far as I can tell, it is the intended first mode for players, as in this mode, per mission you earn money to be used in freelancer mode. All the missions re resolve around a few core objectives. They all need something to explode. It might be a person, a mech, an orbital gun. Most have side objectives, like destroying all the ammo depots on the map, for example. Doing side objectives means you get a bigger payout, which means you can then spend more in freelancer mode. Missions often have different selections of vehicles. Some might only have one choice, while some might ha have three or maybe even four. And these kind of act as a difficulty slider. And I don't, I don't know if this holds true for the campaign, but in Freelancer, certain vehicles have different vehicle payout scales. So smaller vehicles often pay more than the biggest mechs. Risk versus reward, basically. No idea if that's here in the campaign, but I imagine it is. This more restrictive options on vehicles and loadouts means that the campaign is a challenge mode, as I said before. It can be beaten first or last or alongside experimentation in the freelancer mode. Speaking of which, the freelancer mode is the game's bread and butter. It's the mode where you pick a vehicle and weapons and you go ape shit and you destroy crap. Every level is somewhat random, you can do massive runs or you can do tiny ones. Because to a point, it can be an endless mode. Some of these runs are two levels long. Well, one of them is 38 levels long. And as you can imagine, the more levels in a run, the more money that one run gives you. Each district or level that you go to within the run has the same three objectives. Destroy all orbital cannons, remove marked targets, or kill 70% of all enemy forces. And this may sound boring because you are just repeating the same tasks. But the real fun of Brigador and the freelance mode as a whole is just playing around with different loadouts, experimenting with different power fantasies effectively. Each pilot you can buy has different stats. Some are more difficult, some are less difficult. Some have greater payout, some have lesser. You generally just want to be moving down the list until you hit Precursor James, as he is the most difficult and potentially profitable pilot. But other than the pilots, you can just experiment with weapons and vehicles. You can be a small mech with a massive fuck off gun, or you can be a massive mech that has so many guns that it just doesn't matter anymore. You can play a more hit and run focused build, or just focus on raw firepower. It is all possible and it's all fun for different reasons, which I think is really the draw of this game. It's really flexible. It's still going to be a top down vehicle destroying simulator, but it can be a lot of different games within that. It can be a stealth game, an action game, a roguelike or even a narrative game if you really want to read into it a lot. Talking about which, what even is the story here? I mean, the game starts with that powerful line about the great bleeder being dead and how Solo Nobro must fall. But who is the great leader, and what is Solo Nobro? Well... Solo Nobre is the largest city on the colony world of Novo Solo. It was a mining colony that was started by some con 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 big company, led by the so Solo Nobre concern. But it was pretty short-lived as the uh, great leader in NEP came along and took it over. NEP is a paramilitary group and the great leader is their great leader. He's basically the biggest can of worms ever. He was both shit and great at the same time. Once he became the dictator, he began to introduce a lot of isolationist policies. Placing Solo Nobre on its own, a massive installment of orbital cannons presented people from leaving or attacking. 
These cannons were, uh, well, they were mostly run and defended by armies of citizens forcibly constricted into the army. This lowered crime rates, but people weren't the happiest with them. Probably because you also resettled people at will, stopping visiting family and friends, or just travelling in general. But he also did bring this lonely you know, little mining colony into a developmental powerhouse who produces their own goods and is self-sufficient. So, it's a mixed bag. It is worth noting that most people actually preferred living underneath his rule compared to the SNC, the uh, Solo Nobre Concern, citing an increased quality of life. But well, just as the game actually starts, he dies, and we get hired by the uh, Solo Nobre Concern as a mercenary, or as the game calls it, a brigadier. We're tasked with helping the SNC assault districts under the control of the Great Leader's government, with the ultimate goal being to retake the city. And that's about all the narrative you really need to play the game. Individual weapons have more lore, as do mechs and their pilots. But the general gist is everything I just said. It's basic, but it does the job. And of course, you can read into it more if you want to. So overall, not a bad job. And, well, there's not too much left to be said about Brigador. It's a pretty simple game, it's quick and it's easy to pick up, but it can be brutal in some of the later levels. The core loop, however, is easily repeatable and fun for really, well, until you get sick of it. I do wish there was a larger amount of more interesting vehicles, but I do also understand the amount of time it would take to implement even one vehicle. So as it stands now, there's, there's enough stuff in the game to keep most people entertained for at least 15 hours. Or more, if you're willing to do one of the endless runs. Which means that the price is pretty reasonable. Plus the game has, um, well if you hit H, a horn happens, and some of the horns are pretty funny. And well, that was Brigador. Next time we check out something a, a little different. Thanks for watching, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll... Catch you in the next one.